Amen. Can we join with our praise team and shout hallelujah to the Lord this evening? Yeah, we're hallelujah. glad that forever, all our days, that we'll be able to praise him and worship him and be with him. And we're excited about how, what the Lord has even done for us today. Yes, yeah. Woke us up, started us on our way, brought us back into this virtual space. And for that, we are forever grateful. Well, welcome everyone to uh, our Wednesday night uh, Bible Institute class on spiritual maturity. I pray you've had a great day, and I'm, I pray that you're ready to hear what the Lord has to say this evening. We'll be led again this evening by Minister Vanessa Johnson. So let me pray to open us up, and then we will turn it over for Minister Johnson for tonight's teaching. So Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for being so good and so kind. We worship you today because you are God and you are God alone. You're the one who's sovereign over this entire universe. You're omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. You're infinite, you're immortal, you are immutable, and you are invincible. And you are holy, and you are good. It's those godly attributes, Lord God, that we can lean on whenever we're in trouble and know that you can be the anchor we can hold on for our lives. Also, thank you, Lord God, for your grace tonight. Your grace continues to be a blessing in each one of us. Whether you love us and by waking us up, whether you love us by giving us food, whether you love us by giving us shelter, whether you love us by healing our bodies, whether you love us by um, just taking care of us throughout the day, we thank you for your incredible grace, the unmerited favor, the unconditional love you bless us with every single day. You also have blessed us with the presence of the Holy Ghost. Yes. Pray right now that through the Holy Ghost that you will take control of what goes on in this virtual space this evening. We pray, Holy Ghost, that you will help us to forget everything that's going on today. We want to focus on you and you alone and the word of God as we go forward in our study tonight. We thank you, Lord God, for your servant, Minister Vanessa Johnson. We thank you for her anointing and how she is prepared for this lesson tonight. Pray right now, Lord God, that you will send your warring angels all around her. Protect her, Lord God, as she preaches the word of the Lord tonight. And as she preaches, Lord God, we pray that people will be healed, delivered, and set free, and the message will go out with power and authority. As we come together tonight in this Bible study, we want to thank you for our leader, Bishop Donald Hill, Jr. We want to thank you for his anointing and for his vision to put this together. We pray, Lord God, you continue to send a word of healing to his home. You continue to give him rest and restoration, and you continue to give him vision, and the vision you've given him will be put together in this world. Dr. Lord, we just pray you have your way tonight. Holy Ghost, take control of all that goes on. Saturate the atmosphere right now so that you are glorified and your people are edified tonight. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Go ahead, Minister Johnson. You're on. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, Deacon Turk, and uh, good evening to everyone. And uh, of course, I would um, uh, like to say, uh, of course, giving honor to God, who truly is the head of our lives, and to our bishop and our first lady, Pastor Phyllis, and honor to you, the saints of the Most High God, the body of Christ. Thank you for joining me tonight. And as we continue our journey uh, in spiritual maturity. And um, I don't know if everyone has gotten the book yet, but the book is, here we go, Spiritual Maturity. And it's by Mr. Frank A. Thomas. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, Preserving Congregational Health and Balance. And of course we want uh, to have a healthy and balanced life which will lead us to a healthy and balanced congregation, okay? And so um, uh, I would like to start by repeating his thesis, you know, his main point and, and what spiritual maturity and healthy and balanced congregation can look like uh, through a balance of personalities, processes and facts which can lead to a functional hierarchy, which is the church of equality and privilege of participation. And of course, he defines privilege of participation as true, reliable, and timely information that allows people to make the critical decisions of their lives. So we as leaders and we as, um, uh, in the church, leaders of the church, we really have to uh, present 
truth and it has to be reliable and it has to be timely so that people, the people in the congregation, as well as people who visit us can make um, critical decisions in their lives. And so that was his overall thesis. And um, our objective tonight is that we want to realize uh, or recognize when we are playing the victim or when we are playing the savior, okay? So we're in lesson number three, uh, module two, lesson number three, and it's on, uh, we're starting at page 22, and lesson number three, the dance of immaturity. And uh, our author, he takes his text from 1 Kings chapter 21, and uh, he gives kind of a statement uh, to uh, uh, start us off. Every victim needs a savior and every savior needs a victim. And victims and savior together do a dance of immaturity that is destructive to both lives. And the scripture that I'm going to read is 1 Kings chapter 21 and it's verse four through seven, okay? So Ahab, went home sullen and angry because Naboth, um, the Jezreelite had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my father. He laid on his bed sulking and refused to eat. His wife Jezebel came in and asked him, why are you sullen? Why do you not eat? He answered her because I said to Naboth, the Jezreelite, sell me your vineyard, or if you prefer, I will give you another vineyard in its place. But he said, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel, his wife, this is how you act as a king over Israel? Get up and eat, cheer up. I'll get you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so uh, our author, he, he discussed about playing the victim and playing the savior. And we're gonna take a look at Ahab and we're gonna take a look at Jezebel. And we're going to see how Ahab played the victim and how Jezebel played the savior. And what was, what were their payoffs? What did they get out of playing the victim? And what did they get out of playing the savior? And this will give us some insight. You know, last week I talked about our self-evaluation and using tools to help us evaluate ourselves. And so I gave three tools last week, but um, today we're gonna look at examples of Ahab and Jezebel, and we're going to glean from some of their behavior, which was not appropriate, uh, which will then warn us if we are moving into uh, the, the behavior. So now Ab Ab uh, Ahab, he wanted something, he couldn't have it. So he got upset and he was sulking and he was angry. And so here we have uh, a situation where he's sulking and he's angry, right? And so he's going to move into this victim mentality. I didn't get what I want. Poor me, boo-hoo me. He goes and he lays on his bed and he's just looking like a wounded uh, puppy. So here comes, you know, Jezebel, and she's like, now what's wrong with you? I'm going to paraphrase <laughs> some of this. And uh, he says, well, you know, Nabal didn't sell me the land. And so now Jezebel, she then takes it upon herself to save him. So now she's going to play the role of the savior and she's going to fix everything. And so these two examples right here of do we play the victim to get our way or do we sometimes play the savior so that we can feel empowered, 
and feel like we got it all together, okay? And so now, as we look at, at Ahab, um, he wanted the land, okay? And he could not have the land because first of all, the land was not for sale. And then the owner of the land, Nabal said, it's my inheritance. So not only is it not for sale, it's my inheritance and I'm not going to, um, to sell it to you. Now, Jezebel, this is how she formulated her plan. And I really want us to look at this. And so let's take it to the word of God because um, this, this is the crux of the matter. So we have Ahab who's all upset, he's sulking and he's sad. Now here comes Jezebel to play the savior. And this is the scheme that she came up with, okay? And it begins at verse eight. So we're in uh, 1 Kings chapter 21, and I'm gonna start at verse eight. And I'm reading from the uh, New King James Version. And so this is what Jezebel did. She wrote some letters in Ahab's name, right there. Right there, she's starting off lying, okay? All right, and then she sealed them with his seal and sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who were dwelling in the city of Naboth. She wrote in the letters saying, proclaim a feast and seat Naboth with a high honor among the people, okay? And see two, two uh, men, scoundrels, before him to bear witness against him, lying, okay? Uh, saying, you have blasphemed God and the king. T then take him out and stone him that he may die, okay? So we see the end product of lying, okay? So the men of his city, the elders and the nobles who were inhabiting the city of his city did as Jezebel had sent uh, them to do. And it was written in the letters which she had sent them. Uh, and then she proclaimed a fast and she seated Nabal with the high honor. So now she's playing with, and she's being very manipulative because she's putting him right in the mix right in the middle, in a place of high honor. So now all eyes are on him. And then she says, uh, and then the two men, the scoundrels came in and sat before him. So now he's in the middle of everybody. These two scoundrels come and sit right in front of him, right? And, and then the scoundrels witnessed against him. They started lying in the presence of the people saying, Naboth has blasphemed God and the king. Then they took him out of, um, outside the city and stoned him with stones so that he died, okay? Uh, and so this is the word of the God. Then they reported back to Jezebel that Naboth had been stoned and he was dead. So this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so I really want to address this lying, this lying demon. And we see this lying demon uh, just running amok today. And so we can take this story and literally transplant this story into uh, today's time. And what lying does is lying sets up this alternate reality or narrative which then propels people to make decisions based off of this false information. So uh, for example, she you know, created the scene where there's a banquet, right? She places um, uh, Naboth at the center of the scene and then she has people lying. She wrote the letter, so she, she lied first by writing the letter and saying that the letter was from Ahab. So now what are the people going to do? The people or the men of the city react based off of the lie. So they're thinking they're doing an honorable thing by stoning Nabal to death. When in actuality, these lies created this, this fake situation 
for people to respond and behave in a way which led to the death of Naboth because of the lies. And if we transplant that today, we can see the lies of stop the steal. We can see how people bought into that lie. We can see how people then being emboldened and empowered by the lies and then edged, edged on um, by reports and everything like that, how they then thought that they were doing the right thing by going and um, storming uh, the Capitol. And so this, this is so appropriate for the times that we live in and it gives us an insight to what lying can do. You know, there was a time in my life where I thought lying, you know, if I lied to a person or the person lied to me, it basically stopped there. You know, okay, the person lied to me or I lied to somebody and it was contained in that interaction. But now I see how lying can really create in people's minds and in people's imagination this, this, this reality. And the reality is fake, it's false, but it's real in their mind. And then they start making decisions out of that false narrative that they have built in their mind. And this is why last week when I was talking about the inability to think and process, to, to critically think and process information and how we are responsible for digging out the truth and then making decisions based off of the truth. And we are responsible as leaders to give people the truth of the gospel so that they then can make appropriate and critical and timely decisions for their lives. We cannot mess around with lying. We cannot create these false narratives that, you know, the, the preacher is, you know, all in all and, you know, don't touch my anointing and all of these things that people use the word of God to elevate themselves and create this sense of, well, you know, uh, I don't want to, to say or do anything um, that, is, is not appropriate. So it's, it's also a way of control. So this is why you have to, you have to think for yourself. You have to read your word. You have to form a relationship with the Lord and, the, and allow the Holy Spirit to teach you because lying can lead to literally life and death. Lying can lead to a death of another person or lying can lead to the death of yourself. And, and so I wanted to really address this lying demon. And so um, I've met people who, you know, embellish the truth. Uh, they lie on their resume. They say they can do things that they can't. Um, and so, you know, you say, well, you know, everybody, it's okay. It is not okay. This is something that we really have to deal with in life. And it's not easy to tell the truth, especially, um, well, it, it, is, it is not easy to tell the truth all the time. But what I wanna say is it's not appropriate to lie, but sometimes people don't need to know what is, in, what is going on. Sometimes people are just being nosy. So you have to be able to discern, do I have the authority to speak this to this person? Is, is, it, is it coming from a place of love? Do they want this information because they really wanna help or do they just want this information because they're gossiping? So this is where you have to have your discernment and say, okay, although I know the truth about something, that doesn't mean that I should go and share with everybody. It's kind of like a need to know basis, you know what I'm saying? If somebody does not need to know something and they are asking questions about something or somebody, 
that they really don't need to know, you can, you know, say, well, you know what? I don't have the authority to share that information with anyone. No one has given me permission to share that information with you. I'm sorry. And you leave it right there. That's it. You know, uh, uh, cause sometimes you don't want to say, you don't want to lie and say, well, you know, I don't know anything about that when you do know something about it, but you really don't have the authority to share. And especially as leaders of the church, we have to take this, this spiritual journey and we have to take it very seriously because people allow us into their personal spaces, into their spiritual spaces. And this is a very um, special and um, uh, relationship. It's a special place where um, you cannot go into people's place, spaces and just trample um, who they are and, you know, what you believe, well, she needed to hear this or he needed to hear that. That is not your job. And I really wanted to address that. And, and also moving into judgment. You can't judge people. You have to give people grace to grow and grace to experience um, their own decisions, even if you know, as a, like my children, if you know they're making a bad decision, it is still their choice to make that decision. And then you, you might know the outcome, but you still have to let them grow. According to our author, this is the way you learn. They, this is the way you grow. Um, and when you experience the pain of making a bad decision, that will then take you into self-reflection and seeking out the truth of the matter. So, you know, um, but I just really wanted to address this lying spirit because I did pray about this and I said, Lord, what is going on uh, here? And um, that spirit of lie is a very dangerous, a deadly spirit. And we cannot play with it. I don't care if you say, well, it's a little white lie. No such thing. A lie is a lie. And we, we as responsible, mature, uh, Christians always have to present the truth uh, of, of a matter, okay? And so we see that Ahab got what he want, he wanted. So, so that's one of our goals, the payoff. What was the payoff? You know, uh, what was the payoff of Abraham, uh, Ahab? I'm sorry. What was the payoff of Ahab? What did he get out of playing the victim, you know? What did he get? And one thing he got was he got the land. He got his way. Now, now that can reinforce a person's behavior like, hey, if I play the victim, then I can get my way. So then they then constantly use that pattern of playing the victim so they can get their way. Playing the victim so they can get their way. And you know, <laughs> we've all seen this. People who start trouble get caught in starting the trouble. And then once they're caught, they play the victim. Oh, oh, the district attorney is coming after me. No, <laughs> you started that trouble. And now you have to be responsible for your actions. Oh, they just don't like me. No. It's not that nobody like you, you, you're breaking the law and um, you have to pay the consequences. You, you get indicted, you break the law. And so, <laughs> you know, playing the victim and, and <laughs> this is a little bit of sidebar, you know, sometimes I used to watch those Karen videos, you know, and uh, the women would go and they would start some trouble. Then if it didn't come their way or come out their way, then they start crying and playing the victim. And I, I said to myself, now, if they would mind their business, their business in the first place, and then they wouldn't be in the situation that they're in, but they start trouble. Then when it doesn't turn out the way they want it, they turn on the waterworks and play the victim and then talk about calling the cops. So there's such a pattern there that it just makes you want to laugh. You say, oh my goodness, here we go again. Watch, watch. 
but <laughs> pride does come before a fall. And, and you're absolutely right. And so a lot of things that motivates us, you always have to look at what is motivating the behavior. And sometimes people are prideful. Sometimes people do it out of envy. People do stuff out of hate. Sometimes people just do stuff because they want to do it and they feel empowered. Sometimes people are just plain old mean spirited and they, they just want to see other people suffer. So, um, and, and we see that down at the border, you know, um, just suffering, putting wires up and, and all kinds of stuff to do harm to people. And it's just inhumane, but that's what we see. So we have to call these things um, as they are. So we see that the payoff that Ahab got was that he got the land, but he didn't get it in an honorable way. Now, question number two, what was the payoff of Jezebel? What did she get out of it? Okay, now I can't see your chat, but put it in the chat. What did Jezebel get out of this situation? And uh, so I'll let you put it in the chat and uh, let it pop up, but she felt empowered. She was in charge. She pulled the strings. She was the puppet master, you know? And so, excuse me. Um, and so that's what she, uh, that was her payoff. Uh, anybody else have any uh, comments on the payoff that Jezebel uh, got? Please share them uh, with us. And so she was the rescuer. She rescued, you know? Um, and uh, she obviously now had power um, because the king now has total favor uh, towards her because she helped the king and she made, thing, it made it happen. That's right. So now the king is going to go to her all the time. You know, oh, she made it happen one time. She can make it happen again. So that was her payoff. She got, she got you know, empowered. Uh, she got position. She got power uh, for lying and then causing the death of an innocent man. My goodness, help us, Lord, help us, Lord. And so that is uh, what we wanted to address uh, for lesson number three. Now um, we're moving into lesson number four, okay? Now lesson number four, the objective, one of our objectives for this lesson is that I want you to write down a time that when you experience psychic pain. So we're going to discuss the definition, the author's definition of what psychic pain is, okay? And so we're moving into uh, lesson number four. And um, his statement uh, about this lesson, the author's statement, one's ability to allow others to experience pain and the consequences for themselves is the key to avoiding the posture of savior. So then he reinforces that we do not want to play the victim, but we do not want to play the savior. We have to let people experience things for themselves. We cannot rescue people, you know? And although uh, Jezebel rescued Ahab, is still in the end, they both, if you keep on reading, it did not turn out well for either one of them. It's a deadly, immature dance. And that was the, the definition, um, that was the title of lesson uh, number three, that immature dance between savior and victim. And it is detrimental to both people because one doesn't allow person to experience what they need to experience and then the second one, uh, you get a false sense of, you know, I'm, 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 you know, in charge and I got it going on and it's all about you instead of about Jesus, okay? And so now getting back to lesson four, walk into the storm, okay? And our author uses Matthew chapter 14 and uh, verse 22 and 23, and it reads, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out 
to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Then this is what Peter said, Lord, if it is you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And this is Matthew chapter 14, verses uh, 25 to 31 is the, is the total scripture, but he just plucked a little bit out. And so I really want to uh, address during this watch of night, Jesus went out uh, on the lake, right? And um, the definition, well, that's, that's one thing, but let me just get back to the definition of psychic pain. Um, psychic pain is the inevitable breach between what we expect to get and what we actually receive. And so I just wanted to really um, put a pin in it and say, you know, have you ever expected to get something and you turned out and you didn't get it? You didn't get what you wanted. Um, you planned, you worked hard for it, you prepared for it, and it just didn't turn out the way that you wanted it to turn out. The author calls that psychic pain. When we really want something, but yet, it doesn't come about. And then he goes on to say that in order to deal with that psychic pain, we fall into the patterns of victim savior. So I didn't get what I wanted and you played the victim, you know, or I didn't get what I wanted and I'm waiting for somebody to rescue and save me. And so uh, we cannot have um, abnormal or um, unhealthy coping mechanisms to help us through life when we don't get what we want. Because in reality, you know, life is, that is life. You don't get what you want, but you have to deal with the things that come your way. And it's good when you get your way and things work out, but most of the time, it doesn't work out. If you start a business and the business fails, you have to pick yourself up, dust yourself off and evaluate, reevaluate, wait, come up with another business plan and start another business. Why? Because the tools you have to start the first business is the same tools that you have to start the second business. The ability that you had to start the first business are the same abilities that you have to start the second business. And so we have to um, recognize that we're not going to fall into a victim savior pattern when we don't get our way. We have to say to ourselves, critically think, self-evaluate and say, hey, if I did it, one time, I certainly can do it again. If And try, try until you succeed. And if you don't succeed, then you reevaluate, you readjust, and then you say, well, listen, I think I'm gonna have to come up with a different plan. And, and that's what life is. Life is about dealing with the crises and the disappointments in life. And so, you know, I always told this, this, this um, story to my sister. <laughs> you know, I talk to my sister every day. And I said, you know, I said, people who want to become managers, right? They want to become the manager because they can be in charge of people. But they don't have the ability to be in charge of people. So 
they they want to they want to tell you how to do your job when they don't know how to do their job. And so what they do is they instead of being a manager who's kind of like a a, a reference person, you know, you can go to that manager and they know the ins and outs of the job, they know the policies and the procedures, or you can have a manager who's a great team builder. They, they build the team, people wanna work with them, you know, um, that kind of stuff. You can have a manager who's a great crisis manager. You know, uh, when things are going awry, they seem to know what to do, all the emergency plans, they kick in and they that's when they're at their best. So you have different people with different talents, but if you have a manager who has no talent and all they do is they want to top the title and when things are going fine, they're walking around like I'm the manager. But then when a crisis happens, they fall apart. Or when they have to go uh, to a meeting to solve some kind of idea or to move the company forward, they want to push it off to someone else and say, well, I'm going to send this representative and you take the notes and bring it back to me. And or uh, to hide the fact that they don't know what they're doing, they become mean and punitive and always combative towards people. And so, you know, we, my sister and I, we talk about this all the time, people who are not qualified to do a position and how they utilize um, coping mechanisms to hide the fact that they don't know their job. And these coping mechanisms they use are to, to punish the employees or to criticize the employees. They become very negative towards uh, the situation because they really just don't know what they're doing and they're hiding their 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 inabilities to manage. And so that's another coping mechanism that is dysfunctional, <laughs> but people do it all the time. And so we do not want to fill in that space of, of, of disappointment with um, coping, coping mechanisms that are just not uh, positive and they're not healthy and they hurt other people. And so we have to learn, the, the author calls this, uh, we have to learn that there is a natural limit to our time, our knowledge and our power and that we're just human beings. We, we don't know all, we're not all knowing, we're not all powerful, we're not all present. Uh, uh, we're not everywhere at the same time. Only God is there, is that. And so we have to understand that we have limitations and we have to accept the fact that we are humans and that we make mistakes. And then if you make your mistakes, then you can correct the mistake or evaluate you know, the math problem that you did in your head doing the math to solve the problem. And you can say, oh, I went awry on step two, or mm, I should have started at step one differently. Do you know? Then you can really uh, reevaluate yourself. That's the problem of not thinking. If you let other people think for you or not do anything, then even when a mistake is made, you can't even go and say, well, let me see, let me check how you were thinking. You tell me how were you thinking? What were you thinking about this situation? They go, I don't know. It's like, well, you didn't think about it. You didn't have a plan. You don't have a process. Well, no, I was just waiting for somebody to do it for me. That's the worst thing that you can do is to sit around and ask for somebody else to think for you or to do it for you. You cannot do that, okay? And so we all have limitation. And, and so we cannot, in these natural limitations, we cannot change people. Only people can change themselves. The only person you could change is you. And you have to have a desire to want to change. So why beat yourself up or hit your head up against a brick wall when that person doesn't want to change and you're trying to change the person.
you know, and, and, and let me tell you, some of us have done this in, in, you know, going to see, you know, somebody, I want this person to go to church. You know, you pick them up, you, you almost hit them over the head with the Bible, but they're not ready to receive the Lord. And so you have to say, okay, God is here when you when you're ready. The Lord will be waiting for you when you're ready. Sometimes people oh, wake up. And sometimes people say, you know, I'm having, you know, too much fun in life. I don't I don't need the Lord. Somebody is um not muted. And so if you could mute yourself, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. And so, okay, so now we have to realize that we cannot change people. And if we get into that pattern of trying to change people, what it does is it wears you out. You lose a whole lot of energy. You, you, you end up having self-pain and you, have, you get cause pain to the other person. And then you, start in, you, you, you end up injuring yourself or injuring the other person. Meaning, you know, now you have ill will towards that person, which you should have just allowed them to live life and to make their own choice. And you understand that you cannot change anybody. The only person that you can change is yourself. So the author uh, addresses this and says that we have natural limitations and we are not all knowing, we're not all powerful, we are human beings. We have a limited time. And so you cannot put yourself in a role of a savior. And uh, then not only are you putting yourself in the role of a savior, then you're pursuing someone who doesn't want anything to do with what you have going on or what you want. And it only wears you out. It causes pain and injury to yourself and to others. We must accept that people have a free choice. And this is where grace comes in. My God, oh, grace, grace. Thank God, thank you for grace. We have to give people grace, give space for people to make their own decisions. God gave us grace and mercy. We weren't always saved. We weren't always pursuing a spiritual mature life, but we, God gave us the grace to make mistakes and to come to him and ask for forgiveness. We too have to offer grace and say, you know, baby, I know you out there living all kinds of way, but it's all right. God still loves you. And you know, Jesus is going to wait for you because he loves you that much. I'm not ready for church, all them church people. And then they go into all of these excuses about, you know, why they don't want to go to church. But though that's just, those are all, you know, things that they want to say because they're not ready for a change and you cannot make them change. So all you can do is pray. You say, Lord, Lord, in the name of Jesus, save them. Lord you know, convict their hearts, be there for them when they realize that you are an everlasting and an ever loving God. And of course, Jesus was going to be there. And so going back to our scriptures, when Peter started to sink, Jesus immediately reached out and, and saved Peter. Peter was sinking, but God did not let him drown. And so we have to have grace. You know, I try to imagine a bubble of grace around people so that when people start kind of talking out the side of their head, because people sure enough come up to you and they start talking out the side of their head and they say all kinds of stuff. You just have to say, well, Lord, help them and give them the grace to grow and give them the grace to be who they, you know, who you've called them to be. And Lord, give me the grace to love them anyhow. So I, I try to use a visual of a bubble of grace so that when I'm encountering people, I know that God gave me grace and that same grace is for them. And then I can be more patient. I can be more kind. I can be more loving. I can be more gentle. I can listen more 
even when people are insulting you and saying, you know, the church people don't do the church, you know, and, and you're like, wow, you know, well, have you come to the church? No, I never come to no church. Well, have you encountered it? No, they, they just on and on, but you have to say, well, you know what? But for the grace of God, go I. But for the grace of God, go I. And so, um, so Jesus will never ever let us sink and drown. He will, Peter started to sink, but Peter did not drown. And Jesus will never let us drown. And so we too have to understand that that same Jesus who helped us is the same Jesus that's going to help that person that we've been working and praying for, okay? And so we must develop reasonable expectations, reasonable expectations. This is what the author says. We must develop reasonable expectations in life for our personal self so that when that psychic pain happens, when you thought something was gonna happen and it didn't happen and you were disappointed and you feel vexed because it didn't happen, we have to have reasonable expectations of the situation and of ourselves. And we can't play the victim. We can't play you know, um, the savior role. We can't go in to those spaces. I didn't get what I want, so I'm miserable and I wanna make everybody else miserable around me. Been there and a lot of people have been there. You know, and that's just not of God. We are not here huh, sulking and, and being mean spirited. And you say, why didn't why are you acting this way? Well, because I didn't get my way. And I want everybody to suffer, you know. And of course we can see that, you know, I didn't win the election. So I want everybody to suffer. Oh, anyway, we could this is really uh, appropriate for today's times, right? So uh, it goes on to say, uh, give people the courage to walk through the storms, knowing that Jesus will help them and he will help us. When we walk through the storms, I walk through the storms, Jesus will be there. Do not play the victim and do not play the savior. We are never alone. Thank you. Uh, this concludes lesson number four, and I thank you for uh, being with me tonight. I thank you for sharing with me tonight. Uh, God is good, and he's good all the time. I thank him. I thank you. I thank our bishop, Bishop Hilliard. I thank Pastor Phyllis for allowing me to share with you. Deacon Turk. Amen. Thank you, Minister Vanessa. Let's put our hands together and give the Lord some praise for the word of the Lord that came forth this evening. Thank you for that lesson, helping us to become even more spiritually mature. Does anyone have any questions or have any statements about uh, what we uh, were taught this evening? Anybody would like to share? We have a few minutes left where you can do that. Check out some of the uh, comments in the chat. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Vanessa. Awesome, Mr. Vanessa. Excellent teaching. Amen, 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 and amen. Ooh, double amen. Amen, amen, amen. <laughs> he helped her king and she made things happen, right? Pride comes before a fall. A lot of positive comments, but uh, no questions. Anybody have a comment or a question for this evening? <clears throat> or something burning on their heart they'd like to share with us about tonight's teaching? Once, one, twice. A book for tonight. Yeah, it's good. Get that book if you can, everyone. It's a good book. Yes, yes. Easy read. Easy read. All right, hearing none, let me uh, do a couple of uh, announcements and then we will uh, go to our giving moment. Uh, first announcement <clears throat> is don't forget that we are quickly approaching the den for the uh, 40th anniversary celebration for Bishop uh, Donald Hilliard and Pastor Phyllis Hilliard. We're excited about the 40 years that they have been ministering in this vineyard, and we want to show 
uh, them how much we appreciate them by showing up at the uh, banquet and also the other activities that will be going on that week. So if you haven't had a chance to buy your ticket, I encourage you to do so even tonight. You can go to the cathedral website, uh, follow the instructions there and buy your ticket. If you don't want to get it tonight, make sure you see someone at one of the tables uh, in our church on Sunday. Let's make sure that we are packing out the place. Um, you know, Bishop always says that when it comes to his anniversary or his birthday, the biggest present he'd like is to have you all in the celebration. So let's make sure that we buy those tickets and we pack out the Hyatt on November 9th for the 40th anniversary banquet. A couple of things are coming up. We want to make sure that we are uh, uh, aware of on um, next Friday, October 6th. Uh, Brian Stevenson will be at the cathedral and uh, he's going to be speaking. You know, he is the founder of the Equal Justice Initiative, author of the book and the force behind the movie, Just Mercy. Uh, and the cathedral is going to be taking an evening to honor him for all of his work in the social justice arena. So we're looking for people to come and just hear what he has to say. So have a nice worship service and then uh, just fellowship together as we uh, hear about and deal with this whole uh, issue of social justice. And then the next uh, <clears throat> the next uh, Sunday, the 8th, going to be uh, using the Adult Sunday, October 8th. And we're going pink that day. That is going to be the day that we are going to um, observe and talk about breast cancer awareness. So we're you know, encouraging everyone to wear pink that day. Our youth will be in charge of the service, but also will be taking the time to uh, talk about breast cancer awareness, um, do what we can do to increase uh, awareness and information about the subject, and just be a church that is relevant when it comes to breast cancer awareness. So I invite you guys to join us on October 8th for that special service, Youth and Out Sunday, and also Pink Sunday. Well, it's giving time with Cathedral International. It is time for us to worship the Lord in giving this evening. You can see on the screen all of the ways that you can give electronically. So please uh, take advantage of the uh, platform that is most convenient for you. I encourage you guys to always sow into the word that we hear um, every time we come together virtually in this service and do Bible study. I, I pray that you heard things that uh, you would like to uh, follow up on or become manifest in your life. And one way to make sure that happens is to sow into the word, because I believe when you sow into the word, that word will then bear fruit in your life at some time later on. And also, uh, we're a church that believes in tithing. And if you haven't had a chance to tithe and never tried it, I, I encourage you to try it, even tonight. Uh, if you read Malachi 3, you can see well, all the talks about the blessings that come from being a tither and following the biblical instructions that God gives us for how we should give. So I encourage you to do that tonight also if you've had a chance to do that before. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Lord God, for bringing us once again together virtually to hear your word, to contemplate your word, to pray together, to worship together. I pray, Lord God, that now the Holy Ghost, who has been in our midst all evening long, will direct us as we give this evening. Help us, Holy Ghost, to give as you want us to give. And I pray that this offering will be an offering that pleases God. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, Mr. Vanessa, uh, do you have any other comments before you pray us out? Um, just um, when we are dealing with psychic pain, which is disappointment in life, uh, just to reinforce that the Lord is there and he's there to help us. And uh, other people might be experiencing psychic pain. They didn't get what they want. Um, you might feel it's not fair, you know, and uh, a variety of things you might feel, but know that the Lord is here and he's with us and he will reach out his hand and he will help us, you know, and uh, just once again, the, the name of the book is Spiritual Maturity, um, Preserving Congregational Health and Balance by Frank A. Thomas. And we want to be a balanced individual. We want to have a balanced church uh, so that we can share the gospel in truth so that people can make 
critical choices for their lives in the name of Jesus. Well, I guess I'm going to pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I do thank you and I do magnify your name and I do glorify your name for you're worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. Father, I just want to thank you. I, I just really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You are such a good and awesome God, you have been there for me. You have lifted my head when my head was hanging so low. You have lifted the burden off my, my shoulders when my shoulders were weighted down like two boulders were on my shoulders. Lord, you straightened out my neck when my neck was twisted and like a pretzel. But God, you relieved the stress. Lord, you've helped me. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being there. Thank you for lifting me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for carrying me through. And I pray a special blessing upon each and every person under the sound of my voice that you would send your ministering angels to, to minister to them, to meet them where they are, to meet every need, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for those who are in the hospital beds. I pray for those who are suffering from various diseases and sicknesses. And Lord, I ask that you would stretch out your mighty hand and heal them. God, you're a healer. Lord, you are ever present help in times of trouble. And so Lord, in the name of Jesus, there are troubles all around us, trouble in the land. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, it comforts me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runneth over. Ah, hallelujah to Jesus. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord in the name of Jesus we pray amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. Deacon Turk. Hallelujah. Thank you, Minister Johnson, for that closing prayer. I felt that. Amen. Pray everybody has a good evening. And we'll see you uh, hopefully tomorrow morning at 6.30 a.m. prayer. If not, we'll see you uh, Sunday morning. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. God bless you, Minister. Good night, everyone. Yes, a wonderful good job. Good night, good night everybody. everybody. Amen. Bless you. Good night. God bless you. God bless you. Hey. Good night. Good night. God bless you. Good night. Good night, Deacon Vanessa. <laughs> Always want to finish off with you. Love you. Good night. Excellent Good night. teaching. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for the teaching. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. God bless. Good night.